Now I want to give you kind of the outline. I'll put up as we proceed in the presentation, I'll put up the outline if you're taking notes or anything. You can kind of follow along where I'm at in the presentation. This is the overview of the entire presentation and it's basically divided into six parts. I'm going to kind of in the first three major sections, I will be talking about kind of the context in which to view the bell itself. And that context is very important particularly when we get to the third one because as I'm going to show you, Nazism survived the war. But when I say survived, I mean it survived as an organized, powerful, well-financed entity that incidentally continued independently to research all of these advanced projects that were represented by the bell. Now that's quite a whopper and, and uh, I realize it may be difficult to swallow, but I'm going to be presenting evidence. Then of course, the middle section of the program will be doing the bell itself, what it was, kind of the physics involved. And then in these last two points, we're going to be talking about what I call the rodents at the other end of the rat lines. Because you've probably all heard the stories about how the United States, the Vatican, to a certain extent the British, helped a lot of these Nazis escape Europe and gave them new identities and, and located them in their own countries. But there's one country in particular that's never talked about in this regard and that's Argentina and Juan Perón. And so we're going to spend some time with him because Argentina is a central player in the post-war Nazi story and in the post-war survival of this advanced technology and the continuing research that it's represented. And that brings us, of course, to the final little point that we're going to talk about a fellow down in Argentina doing some very weird things. All right, so let's get started. We're on the first point of our outline. I want you to stop and consider. On May 8th, 1945, when the Third Reich surrendered, virtually all of the component systems of modern military warfare and doctrine had been developed by Nazi Germany in some prototype form and some of that technology was deployed. From jet fighters to medium bombers launching primitive cruise missiles. There you see a Heinkel 111 medium bomber air launching a V-1 buzz bomb to mobile ballistic missile systems phased array radar, and why is that so significant? Well, a phased array radar, my friends, is a radar that is constructed with several antennas that by interfering the signal can bend the radio signal over the curvature of the earth. It's an over the horizon radar. And of course that implies that they're developing this as a means of guidance for long range rockets to target you know who, us. to second generation digital computers. This is a computer that was in the Deutsche Reichspost up in operational circa 1943. Had about the same computational power as the post-war American ENIAC. And incidentally it's a lot smaller and we'll see why in a moment. Battle tested sites, infrared sites for night vision on Panther tanks, which were a bad piece of work to begin with. And these were deployed actually in the Battle of the Bulge. We had the unfortunate happenstance to run into some of these during the Battle of the Bulge. Night vision in 1944, battle tested, combat deployed. To television, here you see a German television camera at the 1936 Nazi Berlin Olympics. The Olympics, as you probably know, were broadcast and there were 
television stations around Berlin so that people could actually go in and, and watch the Olympics on television. And an interesting little sideline to the story is that the American inventor, Philo Farnsworth, actually traveled to Germany and gave many of his patents to the Germans under license to produce this television camera. This was the first televised broadcast of a sporting event in the world in 1936. But now look, by the end of the war, that television camera has been miniaturized to a device a little bit bigger than an ordinary shoebox. And that implies that they have made tremendous strides, and this is a very important point and you'll see why in a few minutes. They have made tremendous strides in the miniaturization of electronics. And that requires semiconductors. These are German semiconductor chips from about the year 1940, 1941. These are photos taken by uh, Allied intelligence crews that went into Germany after the war and discovered all of this. Now, why are semiconductor chips so important? Well, look at this. This is a little vacuum tube called a klystron tube. And this tube is about as big as the last knuckle on your little finger. This was in use about the middle of 1940 and became common in 1941. The American and British equivalent of this tube at the end of the war is 10 times bigger. In other words, if you're going to miniaturize an A-bomb to put on your rockets, you're going to have to make as much efficient use of the weight. Oops, I think we lost our signal here. There we go. You have to make as much efficient use of the weight of that rocket as is possible. So they're making tremendous strides in all of these areas. This is a technology explosion. I want you to remember this little tube because, again, it's an important part of the story. Now, just a little aside. You may remember during the first Gulf War, the networks showing over and over again American and British smart bombs being guided with pinpoint precision into Iraqi bunkers and blowing them up. Okay? in 1991-92. But look at this. This is test camera footage from 1945 of a German television guided missile. Remember that small shoebox I showed you? That little camera, television camera. During a test firing around March of 1945. Off in the distance here you can see the frames. One, two, three, four, and for you folks over here, one, two, three, four. You see off in the distance there kind of, it looks to me like an old derelict ship that they've taken out and parked somewhere in the Baltic perhaps and used as a target. But you can see the television, there's two, three, and now the missile's right on top of it, 1945. Now, if you're not convinced yet that something tremendously significant is going on in Nazi Germany, I want to draw your attention to this document. I reproduced this document in the book that just came out called The Philosopher's Stone. And I want to emphasize something here. I think it's very important for you to understand. The signal event that kicks loose all of this documentation is German reunification from 1989 to 1982. This document was declassified in 1982. And what it is, if you look kind of closely at it, it's a, it's a memorandum, it's a talking point memorandum, just like I'm using up here for this presentation. And it's a memorandum that's been drawn up by a Luftwaffe scientist 
who's going to be making a report to some unnamed Luftwaffe field marshal. And down here, very bottom of the talking points here, you find out why it was declassified for so long, because it mentions the German word Kaskadenprinzip, or cascade principle. Why is that so significant? Well, because in 1944, when this document is dated, the term laser didn't exist. But the physics for it did. And the very principle that is in use in lasers is precisely that of a cascade, a photon cascade principle. So what you are describing in this document, and again, I'm kind of only drawing attention to the last point, but it's very clear when you read the document, I translate it in the book, is that this scientist is describing a project that's been underway for some time, and now he's making the final appeal to the field marshal that he wants to scale it up to full-scale size. Now again, I want you to remember this. Tuck it away in your head because this idea of lasers is going to be important in just a few moments. One German document that was captured by the Allies after the war, and no one knows what this really means, okay? One German document refers to something that they're calling optical telephony, okay? Now the closest thing we have in modern technology that comes to this is of course fiber optics and one of the essential keys to fiber optics in that technology tree of course is the development of lasers. So in other words we have a Luftwaffe document talking about lasers, we have something talking about optical telephony. So what's the significance? Well here's a set of nasty implications. Most of you, I'm sure, are familiar with Lieutenant Colonel Philip Corso's book, The Day After Roswell. And I want to quote, I'm going to read his quotation here directly from the book, page four. Today, items such as lasers, integrated circuitry, fiber optics networks, accelerated particle beam devices, and even the Kevlar material in bulletproof vests are all commonplace. Yet, the seeds for all of them were found in the crash of the alien craft at Roswell. In those confusing hours after the discovery of the crashed Roswell alien craft, the Army determined that in the absence of any other information, it had to be extraterrestrial. Worse, the fact that this craft and other flying saucers had been surveilling our defensive installations and even seemed to evidence a technology we'd seen evidenced by the Nazis caused the military to assume these flying saucers had hostile intentions. And I've added the emphasis up there on the slides for you. Now look what we have. We have a claim of the absence of evidence when he himself has pointed a finger to Nazi Germany. So consider the specific list that I've just outlined for you. He mentions these five things as being recovered alien or extraterrestrial technology seeded into American industry. Lasers, integrated circuits, fiber optics, particle accelerators, and Kevlar. But look at what we found in the documents. We have a 1943-44 German Luftwaffe memorandum. And incidentally, we have some interesting things being said by the German scientists, atomic scientists, after the war at Farm Hall. And I'm going to kind of paraphrase these because these will be important points in a few moments. One of the scientists is wondering why the Allies were able to build the atom bomb so quickly, and he says to another one, well, how do you think they did it? And the fellow responds, his name is Fritz Wirtz. He responds, well, they take a bunch of material and they irradiate it with a particular wavelength. In other words, this is how the Allies were separating uranium, or so he thought. 
And all the other German scientists chime in and kind of drown him out because they suspect the British are re recording them. Then another German scientist by the name of Paul Hartek chimes in and he says, oh, you don't need 10,000 men for that. You only need 10. I was amazed at what I saw at IG, IG Farben. Now there is a technique about, developed about 1980 called laser isotope separation. And what it is is precisely you beam a laser beam, a tunable laser of a particular wavelength at isotope material and that kind of collects the isotope that you want on electrical plates. It's a very efficient way of making weapons grade uranium. And so I think this is why you have the German interest in lasers. Integrated circuits, well, to have integrated circuits, the necessary step in the technology tree are semiconductors and transistors. And I've shown you German semiconductor wafers and a 1941 German tube about that big that is almost on the way to the transistor. Fiber optics, you have a reference in the documents that the Germans were working on something called optical telephony. And finally, particle accelerators. This is interesting because that very same 1943 Luftwaffe document referring to lasers, the cascade principle, also mentions that the way they're going to pump the lasing cavity or power it is precisely by the use of radio resonance particle accelerators. So in other words, the only thing in, in Colonel Corso's list that we cannot find a Nazi antecedent for is Kevlar. To put it succinctly, in my opinion, the list that Colonel Corso gives in his book is not exotic enough to be extraterrestrial. It is exotic enough to be Nazi. And there's one more thing that should be noted about Colonel Corso himself, because remember what he himself suggested. There was this Nazi look to this technology that we recovered at the craft. Colonel Corso himself was, according to some, involved in bringing some of these Nazi scientists to this country. So he knew, and he's kind of suggesting or hinting at this connection. Now I'm going to go into a more specific context. And all of this again, leading up to the bell. I'm going to talk about the Nazi atom bomb and what I call the Cold War Allied legend. And basically, probably most of you are familiar with the legend. The Germans were a bunch of nuclear bumblers and we got there first and we won the war, okay? Now, I'm going to try and refute that case. I'm going to argue that, in fact, the Germans probably detonated an atom bomb around October 10th through the 12th, 1944, and these are the six major points in my argument. We're going to discuss Auschwitz, and we're going to see in that discussion a hidden reason for the massive slaughter of millions and millions of people in Nazi German concentration camps. We're going to discuss a Japanese cable to Tokyo, intercepted and finally declassified in 1979. An unusual map by the Luftwaffe. British atom bomb attack alerts taking place during World War II. In other words, Great Britain is worried that something's going to happen. Berlin's phones going completely dead for 60 hours. And then you'll see the final two things, the Zinsser affidavit and the U-234. So that's what's coming up. So on to Auschwitz. I needn't remind any of you of the horror and human suffering involved in the Nazi concentration camps. But there is a gruesome and hidden logic that few people understand. And that is that all of Nazi Germany's most advanced 
secret weapons research projects relied on this vast slave labor pool that was available to them in the concentration camps to pursue these exotic projects. So please bear in mind, what I'm describing to you from this point on is purchased at an enormous cost in human suffering. At Auschwitz, the Nazi government and IG Farben, the famous German chemicals cartel, decided that they were going to build a Buna plant, a synthetic rubber plant. Now, this turns out to be the synthetic rubber plant to dwarf all synthetic rubber plants. Because in order to construct this thing, it, the construction was begun around 19, late 1939 and on into 1940, it required 25,000 slave laborers from Auschwitz and it required 10,000 German contract technicians to be imported into the region in order to construct this plant. The second funny thing about this plant, and you'll see why in a moment all this is rather odd, is that this plant is very close to a plentiful supply of water, lots of water in the area. Now here's a good one, you're gonna love it. Number three. When this plant finally became operational, it consumed more electricity on a daily basis than the entire city of Berlin, which at that time in the world is the eighth largest in the world. The plant is operational roughly from about mid-1940 on through 1941 and up to about mid-1944. So it's an operation for a fairly long period of time. And folks, I want to stress something here. This plant is, like Art Bell used to say, jimungus. It's huge. This is the mother of all synthetic rubber plants. When it was finally finished, it had cost IG Farben, which had funded the project privately, some 250 million Reichsmarks to build, or roughly about two billion dollars in today's dollars. This is an enormous and costly plant. So I'm thinking, wait a minute here. A synthetic rubber plant does not require that much technical skilled labor, does not require that much normal, you know, blue collar labor, or in the Nazis case, slave labor. It does not require this enormous cost and certainly wouldn't require enormous electrical consumption. So what were they doing? Final clue. When the Farben executives entered the docks at Nuremberg, they testified to the Allied and Soviet prosecutors that during that entire approximately four year period of its production, that plant had not produced one ounce of synthetic rubber. And if we're to believe that, we are to believe that the most technologically sophisticated chemicals cartel in the world at the time, IG Farben, was running a plant for four years and it was a total and complete failure. That was the story. But there is a technology that does require close proximity to water, that does require a huge amount of labor, a lot of skilled technicians, a large, large electrical consumption, and guess what it is? isotope enrichment. In other words, Auschwitz's Buna factory was an Oak Ridge sized uranium enrichment facility. And it was built close to a concentration camp, much like we heard in the Gulf War, Saddam Hussein placing his secret weapons facilities near hospitals or schools so that we wouldn't bomb them. So there's your grisly logic. What technology were they using there? They were probably using centrifuges, thermal diffusion, all of which 
technologies the German had, the Germans had, and then again laser isotope enrichment. So that's the first little clue that something is wrong with the Allied legend about American and British superiority in nuclear engineering. There's a second problem, and that's this 1943 Japanese military attaché's cable to Tokyo that was declassified in 1979. In 1943, the Japanese military attaché in Stockholm, Sweden, cables Tokyo, and I reproduced this document in, in Reich of the Black Sun. I'm just kind of summarizing it here. The cable maintained, first of all, that the Germans were using some sort of atomic weapon on the Eastern Front. And consider the implications of that. Well, if the Germans had the bomb, why they, didn't they use it? Well, counter argument. If they had the bomb, they're more likely to use it on their ideological enemies, the communists, than they were on the Western allies. And incidentally, if you know anything about the vast scale of slaughter that the Wehrmacht inflicted on Soviet Russia, it's way out of proportion to what normal military operational demands should be. Something else is going on on the Eastern Front. Secondly, the cable maintains that the Germans were using it precisely in battles in the Crimean Peninsula in 1942 and later at Kursk in 1943. And here's a good one. The cable is describing that it's getting this information from British newspaper reports, okay? So the Japanese military attaché isn't really even bothering to go out and check his information. He's reading British newspapers, so we'll get to those in a moment. Now, what are the implications? First of all, if true, Nazi Germany is enriching uranium on a massive scale and to an extraordinary degree and getting a two years head start on the United States. Secondly, if the Japanese cable is to be believed, they had also stockpiled some sort of crude atomic weapon rather quickly. And there's another point I should mention. That's up here in number six, up here. And that is that the cable makes it very clear that these weapons are being delivered by conventional but very large artillery shells. And again, that implies that they're miniaturizing this technology to a great degree. Boosted fission, ultra-pure isotopes, and so on and so forth. And again, that takes us back to laser isotopes. But all of this implies that they are dealing with a very advanced, sophisticated enrichment technology and that it's a very, very large project and that some of that technology is precisely laser isotope enrichment. Now you'll love this. Take a good look. This is a 1943 Supreme Command of the Luftwaffe map, a study that is being drawn up for the Luftwaffe in 1943. What you see pictured is Lower Manhattan Island. You see circles drawn on Lower Manhattan Island and a cone above it, which represents the inner circle, the circle of primary blast damage, the second circle, the circle of secondary blast damage, the outer circle, the circle of primary heat damage from an atomic bomb attack on New York City of approximately 15 to 17 kilotons, which incidentally, coincidentally, is about the same yield as the little boy bomb, which we never tested and dropped on Hiroshima. That they're not just doing paper studies is evident by this little article that appeared, kind of reproduce it over here, and I'll try and summarize it for you. In the London Times in August of 1944, or pardon me, 46, this was after the war was over, but the article tells you that in 1944, in October, from August to October, the entire British fire department, medical profession, and constabulary 
was put on a three-month-long secret alert against the possibility of a German atom bomb attack against the United Kingdom. So in other words, they admitted after the war, but clearly the British are worried that German atomic research is much more advanced during the war than they later admit is possible after the war. This is a fun one. Look at the date. Wednesday, October 11th, 1944. So in other words, this little article that appears in 1944 in the London Daily Mail during the time period of that secret British alert against an atomic bomb attack tells you that for some reason that the Allies cannot figure out, the entire phone system of Berlin went dead for 60 hours. Now we know now what we didn't know then, that in the presence of a massive atomic blast, an electromagnetic pulse will turn off and in some cases fry electrical equipment. And the problem here with Berlin, you see, is that the phone system in Berlin was laid in underground trunk lines that were very shallow underground, six or eight inches around the city of Berlin. So they weren't even above ground. So in other words, whatever took these out had to be very, very powerful. And it's during this period of the bomb alert. And we do not know of any coup attempt against the Nazi government during the same period of time. So everything thus far is pointing to an actual atomic bomb test. But now here's the nail in the coffin. This document was declassified by the Clinton administration in 1992, after German reunification. It had remained secret for that long. It's called the Zinser Affidavit. And in it, a German test pilot is describing for his American interrogators what he saw as he was flying his Heinkel bomber out over the Baltic Sea during the time period of October 9th through the 11th, 1944. And I've got to read this to you. And you'll see why we kept it classified for so long. Quote, in the beginning of October 1944, I flew from Ludwigslust about 12 to 15 kilometers from an atomic bomb test station when I noticed a strong bright illumination of the whole atmosphere lasting about two seconds. The clearly visible pressure wave escaped the approaching and following cloud formed by the explosion. This wave had a diameter of about one kilometer. In other words, this ain't no ordinary bomb. When it became visible, and now listen to this, and the color of the cloud changed frequently. It became dotted after a short period of darkness with all sorts of light spots which were in contrast to normal explosions of a pale blue color. A cloud shaped like a mushroom with a turbulent billowing sections at about 7,000 meters altitude stood without any seeming connections over the spot where the explosion took place strong electrical disturbances and the impossibility to continue radio communication turned up. So in other words, Zinser is describing in 1944, an event that he sees in 1944, a mushroom cloud of an atomic explosion complete with the continuing combustion of the nuclear material in the cloud as it ascends. Secondly, a blast and pressure wave of a radius commensurate with the explosion of a fission device. And finally, he describes the malfunctioning 
of his electrical equipment from electromagnetic pulse and all of this, all of this at a time when the details, these types of details of atomic explosions really weren't all that popularly known. So in other words, with this affidavit, we have a corroboration for all of those reasons that the British were really carrying on these secret atomic bomb attack alerts. And I should add, the second point up here, we have corroborating testimony from an Italian officer who was sent as a witness on the ground by Mussolini's government to this very same test. And he describes the test taking place in the same area around, in or around the island of Regan in the Baltic Sea. So we have, in other words, three independent sources, really. British newspaper articles, a German pilot, and an Italian officer. Plus, of course, we have that unusual so-called synthetic rubber plant at Auschwitz. Now I want to point this out because many of you are probably familiar with Tom Cruise's recent movie about the bomb plot against Adolf Hitler on July 20th, 1944. This impending atomic bomb test, in my opinion, may have been the hidden motivation for these very traditionally minded German military officers to consider even attempting a coup against Adolf Hitler. Because on the one hand, if he gets this device and he weds it to his rockets, they know that he will use it. And secondly, they're thinking that this weapon may possibly give them some negotiating leverage with the Allies, who of course, as you probably know from the story, these officers wanted to negotiate a peace. And of course, the Allies had called for unconditional surrender. And if you've got an atomic bomb and they don't, of course, that, that price tag for a peace might have been considerably modified. Now there's another interesting story about the German atomic bomb. In May of 1945, a German U-boat with the number U-234 surrenders to the United States Navy and is escorted to Portsmouth, Maine. And its cargo consists of the following interesting things. 80 gold-lined cylinders of U-235 yellow cake. In other words, the last stage of enrichment of uranium before you metallicize it for fuel in an atomic bomb. And the gold is significant because when you're transporting highly enriched uranium, you don't put it in lead because lead is highly corrosive with uranium and it will corrupt the uranium. But gold will not. So this is a little indicator that the uranium on board this German U-boat that surrenders to us is highly enriched and therefore not the product of an incompetent nuclear program. Second item is equally interesting. Infrared proximity fuses. Because the Allied engineers working in the Manhattan Project who were trying to build not only a uranium bomb for us but a plutonium bomb had quickly learned the math of a plutonium bomb is rather nasty. Because you have to take that plutonium core and symmetrically compress it within under one three thousandth of a second. And none of our fuse technologies would let us do that. So they had engineered a bunch of very ingenious gizmos to try and do that. But the fuse technology itself was still somewhat deficient. But infrared proximity fuses that are fired off by interacting with an electromagnetic signal traveling at the speed of light is a pretty handy thing to have around when you're trying to build a plutonium bomb. And we also got the inventor of said fuses who, 
Unlike the crew of the U-boat was taken to some interesting prisoner of war accommodations. He was taken to the Pentagon where he debriefed top American brass under the chairmanship of a Mr. Alvarez. Now I find this rather interesting because I think probably that this Mr. Alvarez was Dr. Luis Alvarez, a Manhattan bomb, uh, Manhattan Project atomic bomb scientist, who later wins the Nobel Prize for solving the fusing problem for detonating a plutonium bomb. Now on the way to surrendering to the United States, this U-boat had to negotiate some rather treacherous waters between Germany and Norway and then from Norway out over the Atlantic. But as it's going from Germany up to Norway, it travels that narrow gap of water between Denmark and Sweden called the Kattegat. And no less than three times British Royal Air Force planes approached this surfaced U-boat, illuminated it with flares, and didn't attack. And at that period of the war, 75% of all German U-boat and shipping traffic negotiating that little stretch of water was sunk by the British, three times. So in other words, the British either are not attacking because they know something about that ship or we have politely asked them not to attack because we know what's on it. And we know it's going to surrender to us. And that implies a deal has been struck at a very high level. The U-boat goes to Norway where all of a sudden it decides to depart Norway twice and the reason is is that it was getting one set of orders from Grand Admiral Karl Dönitz who was the chief of, of uh, German U-boat operations during the war and it was getting an entirely different set of instructions directly from the Führer bunker in Berlin and guess who controls all the communications in and out of the Führer bunker in Berlin a nice guy that we're going to meet in a few minutes by the name of Martin Bormann. Okay? The second time that it departs Norway under orders from the Führer bunker, it goes back to Germany, to Hamburg, and it, I argue the case in, in the book, The Nazi International, I strongly believe it picked up some passengers in Hamburg. Then it traveled out over the North Atlantic where in its logbooks were missing 12 days Probably it went to national Spain. And then it travels over the North Atlantic towards the Canadian coast. And the Canadians are the ones that first order it to surrender. And guess what happens? We jam our ally, Canada's radio signals to that submarine. And we send out a destroyer which communicates with that submarine by semaphore and the U-boat is ordered to proceed to Portsmouth where it surrenders. So in other words, I believe that this U-boat was a part of a deal struck between Martin Bormann and top American officials, and I'll argue a little bit more of this case later on in the presentation, and top American officials precisely to surrender atomic bomb components to the United States of America. Now please bear this in mind working atomic bomb components. And incidentally, our supply, according to our Manhattan Project documents themselves, as late as December of 1944, our supply of fissionable uranium, according to the metallurgist at Los Alamos, would not be at levels sufficient enough to construct an atomic bomb until November of 1944. November. And yet, when do we drop the untested bomb on Hiroshima? August. However, interestingly enough, another one of those wonderful coincidences, within two weeks of the surrender of this German U-boat, mysteriously, Oak Ridge's output of enriched uranium doubles. 
Voila. Now, unbeknownst to us, when Bormann is negotiating the surrender of this U-boat to the United States, remember that it returns secretly to Germany. Bormann and his friend, Gestapo Miller, we'll be talking more about them in a moment, hop a plane ride out of Berlin with the test pilot Hanna Reich and a German Luftwaffe general by the name of Robert Ritter von Grime. And you probably have all seen the Alec Guinness movie, uh, Hitler, The Last Ten Days. Some of you may have seen that, where they recount this flight. And the story is, official. the official story that is in our history books, is that Hitler, in his insanity, had called this guy up to Berlin through allied controlled airspace over Germany to make von Grime the new head of the Luftwaffe because Goering he had deposed for treason. But what they don't tell you in the official history is that when Hanna Reich and General von Grime were flying out of Berlin in their little airplane on this makeshift un runway on the Ziegis Allee, that they barely cleared the Brandenburg Gate. In other words, they're carrying extra weight. Edomest passengers. Okay? And the reason I say that is because Stalin, in one of the rare moments in his life, that he was probably telling the truth, he confided to Harry Hopkins at Potsdam after the end of the war in Europe that it was his belief and his intelligence that Bormann and at least one other man had made it out of Germany by plane from Berlin and U-boat from Hamburg. So the scenario as I reconstruct it is, look what happened. Bormann surrenders via a secret deal with the United States of America, all these atomic bomb components to us. We in turn order the British, don't attack that U-boat, it'll be traveling on the surface at night. Illuminate it by flares, make sure it's the right U-boat, let it through. But unbeknownst to us, Bormann being Bormann, I mean when you think of Bormann, think of Dick Cheney. <laughs> Think of Dick Cheney without the warmth and charm. <laughs> Bormann, unbeknownst to us, has put himself and a few of his friends on that U-boat. And unbeknownst to us, and with our protection, smuggles himself out of Nazi Germany and for that missing 12 days, the U-234 drops him and his friends off in Nazi-friendly nationalist Spain. And as we're going to see a little later, they make it from there elsewhere. Now there's a final mystery I want to mention here very briefly. At the end of the war, our experts discovered that when we went in and examined the stocks of enriched uranium in Nazi Germany, please follow me here, there were about 600 tons of missing enriched uranium to various degrees of purity. Tons. Refined, enriched, to whatever degree of purity. This means, my friends, that Nazi Germany's uranium enrichment program was massive. And it was very competent and very hidden because the gruesome logic once again is all of this is being done by concentration camp expendable slave labor and we made the deal with the devil Now there's one more aspect to this escape before we break here, and I, I'm going to give you a break because I know this is kind of a long presentation, so I'm coming up to it, so bear with me. We'll be there in a few minutes. Bormann, at the end of the war, assigns to the command of an SS general by the name of Hans Kammler. We'll find out his significance a little later on. But he assigns to General Hans Kammler 
the last long range airplane unit under the command of the Luftwaffe. It's called Kampfgeschwader or KG 200. Now, this is a special unit that had control over all of Nazi Germany's ultra long range heavy lift aircraft. And one of them is an airplane called a Junkers 390. This is, and you'll see a picture of it later on in the presentation. This is a massive six engined aircraft that is not only capable of being refueled in midair, it's one of the first aircraft in the world designed to be refueled in midair. But even without that, it is capable of flying nonstop from Nazi Germany to Argentina. Okay? Kammler, the last time we see a picture of one of these Junkers 390 is actually in Prague. And the significance of that will be evident in, later on. But the last flight plan of this Junkers 390 was probably from around Opel to Prague, back to Opel, up to Bodo in Norway, down to Spain, and then Argentina. So please, again, bear that in mind. I'm laying out this case, I know, slowly and detail by detail, but this is important. Because when you look at what Bormann is doing at the end of the war, he is making absolutely sure that the United States and the Western Allied Bloc and the Soviet Union and the Eastern Communist Bloc are getting roughly an equal division of the spoils. In other words, it is the Nazis who are controlling who goes where and gets what. And part of that deal with the United States is we're giving you atom bomb fissionable fuel infrared proximity fuses, and to the Soviet Union, we're giving the guy that came up with some of our fancy enrichment technology. Ain't that neat? Okay? So in other words, it's an almost equal division of the spoils. In other words, we're being set up during the war for a long period of stalemate after the war. Now, I want to go to final few slides before the break. There are three men that escaped Nazi Germany, two of them on that U-boat and one of them on that Junkers 390. And the three men are Martin Bormann, head of the Nazi party, Heinrich Miller, the actual head of the Gestapo, and an SS general that we don't know anything about yet by the name of Hans Kammler. Now I wrote in my book, Secrets of the Unified Field, and I'm going to read this little quotation to you, the significance of what these three men represent. Bormann, Miller, and Kammler. It is an interesting and unholy trinity to contemplate. For in it, one discerns the outlines of a very sinister shadow, the shadow of a post-war Nazi international beginning to emerge. Consider, if there was to be a post-war Nazi international continuing to develop its own secret projects, it would need lots of money and someone who knew how to handle it, Bormann. And let me break for a minute. To show you what a financial wheeler dealer Bormann was, by 1939, he had control of the personal finances of Adolf Hitler, Eva Braun, Hermann Goering, and Heinrich Himmler. And in order to make his beloved Fuhrer a little more money, he found a loophole in German law. So he forced the German Reichspost, the Postal Service, to pay Hitler a royalty on each and every postage stamp sold in Nazi Germany. That made Hitler a tidy little chunk of money by the end of the war. 
This man is a real wheeler dealer. Again, Dick Cheney without the warmth and charm. <laughs> it would need lots of security and someone who knew how to run it. Miller. And, here's Kamler now, it would need lots of engineering expertise and management experience in coordinating large projects and keeping them secret. Kamler. And they would need a suitably advanced project to work on within the limits imposed by post-war circumstances. Large uranium enrichment plants for A-bombs were out, as were large and very visible rocket gantries. Something truly sensational, which would not require large physical plants other than large power supplies, and which could pay much larger dividends than any of the other above alternatives was needed. The bell. So, here is a second implication. And this is the last slide before the break, so we're coming up. If Nazi Germany was researching all these discrete areas of physics and applied technologies, including the atomic bomb, and incidentally, I didn't even talk about thermonuclear fusion, throw that in there, each of which requires a precise theoretical and applied knowledge of physics, and if none of these projects warranted the classification within the Third Reich of Kriegsentscheidend or war decisive, not even the atom bomb, then what did? And the answer, of course, is the Nazi bell. And so we'll break for about 10 minutes, and then I'll give you the really bad news. Thank you.